So let's see what Carhart says. What's the story? How does he understand this fact? Fact one, one year returns persist. Sort mutual funds into their by their last year's performance, and the best group keeps doing a little bit better next year, although with a lot of risk. Fact two, you can explain this return persistence with a four-factor model, and especially with loadings on a momentum factor. Fact three, kind of interesting. Uh, this is uh, uh, Carhartt's figure two. How long does the return persistence last? So these are the 10 decile one to decile 10. We've graphed here the returns in the formation year. So you can see the winners keep winning and the losers lose. But notice how quickly that return difference evaporates. Now, we hope skill lasts more than a year. Whatever this is, it seems to vanish very quickly. How about looking backwards? It is kind of weird that we're sorting based on one year returns, isn't it? Skill, you would think you, you'd want to see four or five years consistent performance. It's in the paper, I won't show you the table, but sorting funds based on five year past performance doesn't give you anything. So how quickly this skill disappears and the fact that you see it only in one year performance, that seems really weird too. Next fact, maybe what we're just seeing is momentum funds, right? They're loading up on a lot of the momentum factor. Maybe the winners are the momentum funds. No, Carhartt looked at that. Here I'm reading on page 20, 73. The Journal of Finance wouldn't let him put in another table, I guess, so he just told us the words. But if he sorts mutual funds based on their four-factor uh, momentum loadings, then uh, nothing happens. So it's not momentum funds. So what is the story? What's happening here? Here it is in words. My results suggest there's a simple explanation. These mutual funds don't follow the momentum strategy, but they're funds that accidentally holding up, ended up holding last year's winners. Since returns in stocks have momentum, those funds will enjoy one-year expected returns uh, in the future. I made a picture version of the Carhartt story. Um, the winning funds are funds that happen to hold stocks that went up in the previous year, and so that's the fund. If you held stocks that went up in the previous year, those stocks are likely to keep going up in the next year, a little bit. That's the momentum, with, of course, a lot of risk. Uh, some years they go up, some years they go down, go down, but on average, they go up a little more than they go down. Similarly, the losing ones, they were unlucky. They held a portfolio of bad stocks. Those stocks keep going down. And of course, since these are just, we've isolated momentum stocks, uh, those things are exposed to the momentum factor. So that's an interesting wrap up of why Carhartt found the results he did uh, and along the way illustrating the performance attribution model. Carhartt's paper, it's a little uh, orthogonal to performance attribution, but he has one beautiful table summarizing another set of important results that we know about mutual fund performance. Now here, uh, the question is, um, do fees and turnover help investors or hurt investors? Uh, when a fund charges higher fees, has fancier offices, uh, uh, buys and sells a lot of stocks, is that good for you as the investor? Now again, don't jump in and be cynical about this and assume the answer is no. In fact, simple logic tells you the answer should be yes. The fun, if you ask a fund manager, what about all those fees? Aren't you just taking money out of my pocket? The manager will say, no, of course not. Those fees are, are, are what, what keeps our research department in business and, and they find the good stocks and we make a lot of money and you get some and we get some. He'll tell you higher fees means higher performance for the investor. A really cynical University of Chicago economist would say no. They pay the janitors the same as other people pay the janitors. They pay the investors the return they can get elsewhere. Investors should get exactly the same performance no matter what fees and turnovers are, and, and the fund just keeps any results of that for itself. It wouldn't make any sense if higher fees led to lower things for investors. Well, let's go look at the facts. Uh, here are the facts. This is a Fama-Macbeth cross-sectional regression, a good example of why Fama-Macbeth regressions are useful. The left-hand side is returns to investors, and the right-hand side are expense ratios, turnovers, and, and so forth. The astounding result is that if the fund spends 1% more, if, if they charge 1% more in fees, the, do the investors get half a percent more, like the fund managers say? Do the investors get nothing more, like the cynical Chicago economist would say? No, the investors get 1.5% less. More fees is just less return for investors. Similarly, turnover, when the fund buys and sells a lot of stocks, are they getting rid of the dogs buying the new, new stocks? No, it turns out that every time they buy or sell a stock, 
you lose about 95 basis points, which is pretty much a, a good estimate of the round trip transactions cost. A very depressing view of mutual fund performance uh, seen in the data. Let's go on. Um, where is this literature now? Uh, this was an easy example using mutual funds and uh, 20 years ago's uh, factors. What's happened since then? We're doing two things. Uh, one, we've applied these techniques to, to uh, hedge funds, sovereign wealth funds, all sorts of different kinds of investments. And along the way, the number of factors has exploded, where once there was just uh, HML, small, and the momentum factor, now it's called UMD, up minus down, that, uh, that Carhartt pioneered. Now we look at uh, uh, carry trade, yield curve, default spread, writing put options. There's all sorts of semi-passive strategies that are put on the right-hand side as performance attribution. To give you a sense of why, I, I brought along a graph. This is a performance attribution of the equity market neutral hedge fund index. So the blue is the, uh, the uh, I'm sorry, the red is the hedge fund. That's what the equity market neutral hedge funds uh, returned. And the blue is uh, one-year returns on the stock market. And you can see up till 2008, that produced quite a puzzle. Uh, whether markets went up or markets went down, the equity market neutral hedge funds seem to do well. They, they, they say, we just pick up pennies here and there. It turned out in the financial crisis, they picked up pennies in front of a steamroller, and the steamroller came. Now, let's think about what are the systematic risks of this strategy. What does a strategy that always makes a little money and then loses dramatically when the market goes down a lot? Well, that's a lot like writing index puts. And if you write index puts, that's a passive strategy that can earn you, uh, earn you a nice premium, but you don't need to pay 2 and 20 to do that. So if you want to benchmark a, an equity market neutral, supposedly, hedge fund, you should put in a passive strategy that includes uh, uh, passively writing put options in order to, uh, to, to benchmark that strategy. This is useful not only for deciding is there skill. Uh, one of the biggest uses of regressions like this is risk management. Aside from the sort of nebulous is there alpha question, if you've invested with a manager like that, you might like to know that the performance of that fund is like writing index put options and will do particularly badly if there's a market crash. You might like to not also write index put options all on your own. So risk management, this kind of regression is extraordinarily useful for risk management uh, above and beyond the alpha thing. So that's where we are. Uh, we do this, we have a very uncomfortable uh, set of factors on the right-hand side. Now, I once said to a hedge fund manager, oh, you don't have any alpha, you're just a combination of, of seven uh, semi-passive strategies uh, right there. And, and he exploded and spilled his beer and said, no, that is my alpha. My clients don't know what momentum is. My clients don't know how to trade momentum. My clients don't know how the carry trade works. Uh, I know how to do that. I know how to trade it without losing my shirt. And that is my alpha. My investors just know about the market and value. I'm and, and if you only have market and value here, those things are genuinely alpha. With 27 sort of nebulous factors on the right-hand side here, I think he has a point. Uh, maybe there is no such thing as alpha versus beta, skill versus selection, uh, a few factors the client understands and the rest is just nebulous market inefficiency. Maybe what there is really is just a whole bunch of different kinds of beta. Beta you know and don't know, beta you understand, and beta you don't understand, and, and this whole skill versus selection uh, 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 distinction is a little out of date. But that we'll have to leave for future research.